So we're going to get started in the afternoon. Uh, my speech is called Up to Speed, the Importance of Clever Onboarding. Uh, my name is Peter Kinlock. So quickly about me, uh, I'm a team lead. I'm a team lead at Stanford. Uh, I've been there about four years. I started out for about two and a half years as uh, an individual contributor and then moved into a leadership role about two or three and a half years ago. Uh, I work on uh, internet onboarding programs. So this talk is likely going to be about the learning that came out of that experience. So prior to that, we, we didn't have uh, anything that was organized specifically for engineers. We did have sort of a general uh, company onboarding that was just specific to like your laptop and everything else. So what do we mean when we say onboarding? So there's a few different definitions. Uh, I think the simplest one for me is uh, getting new hires from day one all the way to job topic. So what does that mean? So there's two components to sort of like a tech knowledge part, cultural knowledge part, and product knowledge part. So, why should I care about onboarding? So, let me hear the move from an IT to a leadership role. Uh, it sort of involves a new focus that, that's larger on this team. Uh, so, your worldview kind of extends a little bit, where before you sort of focus just on a smaller part, you now need to think about the strength of the team, and one of the big parts of that is hiring. Uh, with people and then bring them up to speed as quickly as you can so they can actually contribute. Uh, I think for a lot of people, it's not necessarily a given that an onboarding program is actually important. I know when we first released it, I wouldn't say there was a history to our company that didn't support us, but I don't think it was sort of a foregone conclusion that it was important. So my goal for the first session is to talk about why I think it's important and sort of what the ROI is, and then we're going to get into a little bit more of uh, how do I build one from scratch. So a good question to ask yourself is, what happens if I do nothing? So you can certainly do nothing. It doesn't cost anything. There's no upfront cost uh, of time and effort. Uh, certainly with an onboarding program, there is an upfront cost of time and effort, and there's a little bit of ongoing cost to sort of keep it up to date. So why is it worth it? What if I do nothing? But I think this is a really important point. This is what every new hire does when they start. They figure out the state of the world, and they figure out their place in that. So figure out the state of the world and figure out the place in that world. And, you know, when you start thinking about it, it's quite a universal student sense. It's not just for a new job. It's when you start at a new school, you go to a new country, etc. You're trying to just figure out in a new environment, you know, what is it all about, where that fit in. So the role of onboarding is to help facilitate these two things. And everything you build into it is going to address one of those two things so that you can get to it. And also, sort of as a side comment, which would you rather have? So, the, this is sort of the do nothing option, where you've got like an ad hoc, just uh, different for every hire, no place, depending on the relationship that they've made during the day one, or a more deliberate approach, which is structured, consistent, repeatable, uh, top that whole team. So, let's go through that uh, after we've gone through. So, what I mean by ad hoc, so the first is the do nothing option, which again, you're welcome to do. Uh, ad hoc would mean there's no structure. The person doesn't really know what they're learning or why. You know, they're kind of just moving to the first week and they're supposed to just, you know, learn things and then teach it to them. Uh, it's different for every hire, so you can't really set a baseline uh, of expectation for whatever new hire you know by when. Uh, it's no place when you're struggling each time you're doing it, trying to figure out, oh, wait, what did we do last time? What worked well? And how we can actually change it? And I think most importantly, it's depending on the relationship that you've made in the first place. Uh, meaning, a lot of it's sort of by pitch, like if they're next to them, maybe they'll do a little bit better. If they find some people they like, maybe that works a little bit better. But you're kind of leaving a lot of the chance. So, contrast that with one that's a lot more deliberate. You've got structures, so they know exactly what to do. Uh, you can even take sort of like a service or a skeleton. Uh, it's consistent. So, after each new hire, you know exactly what you can see that you now know. So they now know. It's repeatable, and you, you don't have to scramble each time you actually do it. Uh, and you, you like, scrap it and put it in GitHub. It's, it's, it's published, but it's not published with enough numbers. Uh, it's like uh, overall, but it's repeatable where anybody can go and see what's uh, involved. And it's taught by the whole team. So we have something between, between 10 and 50 of, uh, of our people from both the engineering and the product team that participate on each onboarding sort of session. And so I think that's hugely valuable because you have a new hire that you met, you know, and the vast majority of people they're going to be working with day to day uh, and for some sort of relationship with them before they, you know, are even too far into their tenure. 
So again, this is your other option to, to know the, the option where you can kind of just write it or one of the other ones that way. So the goal for you guys is that it's confident to see as possible. So from day one, you should have confidence in the limit that I'm still as possible. Uh, and one of the big questions you should have asked in front of your eyes is, can I trust this person with that? Or has increasing and chosen difficulty over time? So you're going to always fire in the focus to help with this question. So the fix this question. So help with this question. And ideally, that is going to increase over time uh, because of what you can handle. So you want to have a little bit of predictability into that. I think one more really helps to say that. Okay, this kind of goes through the session. Uh, the session could be here. That sort of helps the rest of the team uh, come back with that a little bit. So, particularly with the ROI, uh, the first four main things I can think of is probably the question more. Uh, you get up to see facts that I mentioned. Uh, you get to know how you really feel like part of the team. Uh, the feeling of love from day one, which really is important because you think they're coming off and uh, being courted by the crew and they're feeling the love all the time. It's going to be special. They come in day one, they don't know where they're supposed to go, they don't have a computer set up. It's a very violent function for you. Uh, it's a bit hard. Uh, it can also be used to insert different, different teams that person might not work with all the time. So, for example, a fifth of your job is five engineering teams. Uh, and you should select which team in your house is going to be on. So, this might be one of the key things that they have to go to uh, all these different teams in a particular way. So, you should just set that to the other uh, so quickly on the role of pair programming. So pair programming or pairing, uh, for the rules for the two engineers work together. Uh, I'm a huge fan of it. We do it quite a bit at our company. Uh, I think it's a big part of onboarding for rapidly uh, getting the skills to where they need to be. But it also gets the exact same thing. I think having a sort of structured uh, time for the different subjects you want to tackle uh, that are all front loaded from the beginning of when you have start is very important. Prior to us doing kind of our official onboarding program, we did rely pretty much exclusively on pair programming, which is, again, much better than nothing, but I think you can do a little bit better at that in the most of the closer session. All right, so the two of you are uh, on board, and you are uh, on board, but maybe you agree with what I said and, and are interested in it, maybe you have an onboarding program that you'd like to bring us to the field. So, how do we do it from scratch? So the first step is to learn from other uh, is approaching good law clerks out there. Uh, that was the first step I took when I was studying to create our onboarding program. Is just read through them, just sort of see where the goal posts are, okay, what, is, what are people doing, and pretty quickly get an idea of what, especially what the big company is doing. So Facebook has like a six week engineering boot camp that all the guys go through. Uh, Twitter has some interesting posts, Google has some interesting posts. You can kind of say, sure, they have a ton of resources. Uh, you know, we're maybe a company that gives you a little bit more uh, of the scope. Uh, that's fine. So don't get overwhelmed by the volume of information and don't worry too much about the, the size of the uh, number of items that you're reading that uh, feel like you really well practiced. You know, someone did for many years and you can't uh, really feel the size of that particular company. I think that's totally okay. And that's what ties into the next question you want to think about when you're, when you're creating it. What's the right size? Is it a day? How do you figure this out? I feel it's really okay to start small. I think even a couple days of the targeted onboarding at the beginning is better than nothing. It becomes relatively easy. The very important part for this is that it's manageable, meaning it's not sucking up a ton of your resources when you really would like it. And that it's sustainable, meaning you don't just go out and do it. So maybe on the first time, then by the third time, it just falls into the wrong way. So it really, um, on this subject, it really helps to have some support and awesome moments. So I'm going to like, seriously, we have uh, one of our recruiters, Jacqueline, who's here today, that's right over there. She always calls schedules for the onboarding system. So each time we have a new hire coming in, uh, it's much like a team that's just brought us to the company. She is trying to schedule all the engineers and the uh, five people for the sessions that they're going to work with this new person. So that, that helps a lot, and I just really feel like it has an owner, it's going to keep going. Uh, we don't need to think about it out every single time. So the next big step is what can we accomplish? And this is really important to figure out to narrow down what are the options that we want to do. Uh, a good way to think about this is to think about what information do you have now that you wish you had back on day one or before? And I would say 
talking to people who are new from college who also are talking about the fact that they do. You know, I've been there, I've been at my company about four or five years, so it's really difficult for me to genuinely put myself back into the shoes of some of these folks who are going to be on. But starting to do three months, it's pretty easy for them to do that. So what information do you have now that you need to have back to day one? You can kind of start building up that from there. So I'll just tell you the specifics of what you came up with. We have to understand what is expected of you. Uh, they should be able to explain our architecture diagram at a high level. And the cool thing about it is we actually start to include our products, which is where we get more and less along our architecture diagram line. And that's too much to see how they all fit together. Uh, we want them to know the everyday terms that are used in our industry. Uh, so, this is an high tech company. So, we kind of can see some jargon that they use our products. The other words, if you don't know this, it's very hard to talk to sales people to understand what a type of sales you're talking about. So that's why that one's pretty important. Uh, sales and human cultural values, that's, that's kind of self explanatory. And then finally, I'll send that one. Uh, expose them to talk fundamentals. So we try to give them a little bit of time inside each code base that they say, or each product that they say, learn about, so that the user and the code base come to you. Uh, they get more. And so finally, the first thing we them into this piece of stuff is simple as that is, uh, on their first day, we're going to go to the market with their new system. It sounds like a small thing, but we, you know, they really to know this, but it's a little bit of time with this team that we created. Uh, this is much more than I would like to try to So this is important to what should it accomplish. We also want to say what should it not accomplish. And that is things that are either going to be not important for your company or maybe not realistic for like a third grade or a fifteen last year specific reason. Uh, so in our case, it was uh, we're, we're deliberately not doing a Facebook style six week boot camp, which is used to determine where the new hire is and what team is going to join. Uh, for a couple reasons. One, uh, for us, the six week uh, boot camp would be a little bit too much input potential. And then we don't really need to determine the speed for new hires before we run that product. Uh, we also decided that it's not expected to bring a new hire to complete job readiness. Uh, for that, we do need to have enough success to have to that to have to And finally, uh, it's not expected to cover the entire ad platform. So the majority of our engineers are coming from different industries and a lot of the experience with the outside the world is fun. Uh, but we we probably like the things that are going to be a little bit more longer term to show that it's totally okay for that to be kind of just pushed off and not to be able to sort of job on that one. Cool. So you figure out what you want it to do and don't want it to do. The next step is to pick a format. Uh, in our case, it turned out to be like 30 or 60 minutes session. We had a variety of technical and product and cultural and process uh, subjects. And I'm just going to see what it looks like. So this is a, this is one of our current onboarding schedule. And there's a few things that I want to mention. Number one, this is a lot of iterations to say that yet. So we've been iterating over the last year, year and a half. Uh, and I really like the structure. I mentioned that structure is pretty important. I think when you, you get to the point of like day one of a hire uh, right now, and it really helps you understand, okay, I'm, I'm on day one of two or day one of six. I know exactly what the theme is for the day. I know what's going to happen. You know, there's no time zone, no space yet for these calendars, but they generally all take sort of like one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and you then talk, you're immediately talking to that team that owns sort of that team's afterwards to go through the day one job. Uh, but I really like how this sort of evolved. When we first did it, we first like had a sort of two sessions done in the field that we didn't think too much about the quarter, we didn't think too much about the team, but this has sort of naturally evolved since then. I really think that makes it stronger for people that are the place to work that sort of like Role of mentors. Um, so there's sort of like explicit mentors and, and what I call capital mentors. So explicit is either you team lead or somebody who can you know, explicitly set to mentor you. And then casual mentoring is more people on your team who just enjoy teaching or you know would naturally kind of bring up the uh, new people on the team. So explicit mentoring, um, we thought about putting into the first version of our onboarding. We ended up not really needing, I think largely that's because our engineering team was a fairly small product that were in like five people. 
which means no one's really going to talk to the fact that this is not the one. I know what it is. I know what it is. I'm going to forget that you need to put some info on the Australian side of the society. I think it might make sense. We've never really used it, but we don't have a ton of things like this.